Greg Peterson here, and I want to thank you for listening to the Urban Farm Podcast. We wouldn't be able to keep doing these great shows without you. So as a token of my appreciation, I'd like to offer you access to a list of our top 10 episodes I personally find most inspiring. If you enjoy the Urban Farm Podcast but don't have time to listen to every one, then you will love this list. Although all our guests have great information to offer, if you are short on time, these 10 are must-listens. To get access to the top 10 most inspiring podcast episodes, text FARMER to 44222. That's FARMER to 44222. And enjoy listening. You're listening to the Urban Farm Podcast, your partner in the grow your own food revolution. Whether you've just been introduced to urban farming or you're a lifelong advocate, we're sure you'll leave feeling more informed, equipped, and empowered to dig deeper into the soil of your local food economy. With you every step of the way, here's your host, Greg Peterson. Today on the Urban Farm Podcast, we have Jake Mace of Longevity Gardens for a chat with an expert all about seeds. We're going to talk about why it is so important to save seeds, grow a garden from seed, grow fruit trees from seed, share seeds, and replant your own seeds season after season. Jake May started his garden in 2011 with a peach tree, a fig tree, a pomegranate tree, a kumquat tree to save money on his food budget. Today, it's a luscious green food forest. In episode one, we interview Jake all about his urban farm and learned some of his best tips and tricks, how to avoid his failures and became inspired by his mission to live a life that's compassionate with a zero to positive sum impact on the earth, particularly through his commitment to a vegan lifestyle. He also teaches martial arts, fitness, tai chi, yoga, gardening, and golf to people around the world via his successful YouTube channel and online schools at jakemace.com. Outside of teaching, Jake's real passion is an advocate for the environment, animals, and people. Jake has been vegan vegetarian for nearly 16 years and believes in preserving the earth, its resources, and its living inhabitants so that future generations can enjoy them as he has. Jake studied Mandarin Chinese while attending ASU and Duke Universities. Jake lives with his wife, Pamela, and their many adopted animals on their edible urban homestead in Tempe, Arizona called Longevity Gardens. Welcome to the show today, Jake. Hey, Greg. It's great to be with you. Oh, my gosh. And you, my man, are one of my favorite guests for multiple reasons, one of which is your your Farm Out Fridays that we do together. We'll talk about those in a little while. And this is your fourth time on the show. You were on episode one. You were our first guest, which was epic. And I was the first one. You were you were our first guest. Yep, absolutely. That's great. And then you were on episode thirty three for your ten favorite fruit trees. That was oh, yes. That, yeah, that was a cool episode. And then episode seventy, talking all about. And I'm going to use. I'll let you tell us, but it was about local. What did you call it? Well, that human society's uh, new global is local. Yeah. So in order to heal humanity globally, we have to think locally. Think locally. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, you're absolutely one of my favorite guests to have. Plus, we do Farm Out Fridays. So why don't you tell everybody what Farm Out Fridays is and where they can find it? Well, that's a very generous introduction. Thank you uh-huh. for all the compliments. <laughs> You know, Farm Out Friday is something that Greg and I do on YouTube. And so if you want to um, not only get good information and good audio, but also some visuals from Greg's Urban Farm and my longevity garden here in the Phoenix area, our edible landscapes, you can go to youtube.com slash vegan athlete because I call myself the vegan athlete on YouTube and look up that YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. And when you go there look for the playlist called Farm Out Friday. Or I'm sure if you just go to YouTube and in the search box, type in type in Jake Mace uh, Farm Out Friday, you'll find the episodes. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. And they are fun to do, man. We've we just we just have a great time doing them. So we we cover all kinds of information from yeah. fruit trees to gardens and everything in between. Yeah, the one we did yesterday. So we filmed one yesterday. It'll be out in the next few weeks. This uh, young lady named Molly had a apricot tree in her front yard, and it had never been pruned. Mm-hmm. And she posted on Facebook actually and said, "Help! Somebody come and help me prune my fruit tree." And uh, I reached out to her and said, "Hey, we can do that on film." 
And she was up for it. And she was up for it, man. And yeah. so we got a chance to um, show the folks how to properly prune a deciduous fruit tree, and that'd be a great episode. I think probably next week. Oh, nice, cool, cool. Look for it soon. Look for yes. It soon. So Jake, we're here to talk about seeds and why seeds are so important. Different kinds of seeds. What kind of seed you'd you'd plant. So let's start. Why is it important to save our own seeds? Well, if you notice, Greg, I've been on your show a few times, and the first time was kind of the introduction to what I'm doing here by growing an edible landscape in an urban setting, you know, in the in the, in the city. Uh -huh. In episode two, we talked about my favorite fruit trees, which is, you know, really important to have fruit trees on your property. Yep. Episode three, we talked about, you know, that how to think locally, and now we're talking about seeds. And so all these things are important. They're all part of the spider's web, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think seeds are so crucially important because I'm what I'm noticing now. I'm in year six of my edible landscape here at my home. I bought this property in 2011. I've been gardening here full time for six years. Uh -huh. And now what's happening is that in my garden, my plants, whether it's a leafy green plant or whether it's an eggplant or a pepper or a tomato or an an, an herb or a potato, whatever, uh -huh. they're going to seed. And they're spreading their own seeds on their own. And now I have uh, volunteer plants for free popping up all over my landscape that I don't have to plant that cost me nothing. And so what I'm finding is that every year that I'm gardening, it's getting cheaper and cheaper to garden because of the seeds. Nice. And so I think that gardeners out there who – are going to harvest seeds off their trees or off their plants. Uh -huh. It's really important to harvest them and store them, but it's also important to let the plants spread the seeds the way Mother Earth intended with the wind, with birds, with rains. And what you'll find is that if you create a habitable climate and a, you know, a microclimate where your garden can thrive in your yard, uh -huh. your plants will do the seeding for you and you'll be storing and saving seeds the natural way which is letting earth in the do ground. it for you in 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 the ground yeah. and then every season spring summer fall winter autumn i have seeds that are applicable to that season popping up on their own like right now all of my spinaches and lettuces and basils they're all starting to pop up and grow again because it's getting warmer in the phoenix area yeah so i had a I had a news anchor here the other day and we were standing in the front yard and the cameraman was standing right over a, a lettuce that was just growing right in the middle of the lawn. And Oh, nice. Yeah. So, you know, when I look around my front yard, there is garlic and arugula and lettuce and onions and things that just they year after year after year. So can you speak to what happens with those seeds as they become acclimatized to your yard? Yeah, I'll tell you something really cool too. I have a relationship with a local gardener in town who uh, grows food for the food bank, St. Vincent de Paul Food Bank. Uh -huh. And this guy gave, uh, hooked me up with a juice company who gives me all the juice pulp to use in my compost after they pulp it. Oh, nice. That would be, to that would be Tony, by the way. His name is Tony. And after they juice the celery, they give me all the stumps. And so what I did is I took all those celery stumps last year uh -huh. and I planted all the celery stumps – no. Uh, in my garden, and they all grew into 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 celery plants ag again. Really? And now what's happened is that those uh, mother plants grew to maturity. They seeded, and now their babies have grown from seed in my garden. So yeah. I'm getting second generation celery grown from stumps that would have been thrown away otherwise. Nice. And nice. so this brings us back to it's it's important to to think about the power of a seed uh -huh. and if your interest if you're an urban gardener which i think a lot of them out there listening are yeah if your interest is to grow healthy food for you and your family in your front and backyard it's going to be important to have some knowledge of how to store the seeds which is always store them in a dark dry cool place mm -hmm. and it's also important to to label those seeds so that we preserve the genetic uh, diversity and identity of plants. So if you have an eggplant of a certain variety, try to save those seeds and grow it again the next season. And the cool thing that happens is that when you grow your own seeds, so first you buy some seeds, you get them in the mail, whatever happens, right? Right. You plant those seeds, you grow a garden. But then once you harvest your own seeds and replant those, they are infinitely stronger and healthier plants than their than their mother and father were because they are now 
genetically more acclimated to your microclimate in your neighborhood. Mm. So if I grow a bunch of seeds here in the Phoenix area where I'm at, yep. each generation of seeds will grow better for me because they'll be more um, appropriate for the Phoenix area climate. Yeah. Excellent. So what happens is, is not only does my soil get better year by year because it's becoming more alive, right? but my seeds become more tolerant of the weather conditions here in Phoenix. And so people are going to say, as my sixth year of gardening turns into my 10th year, turns into my 20th year, they're going to think I'm a great gardener. But in reality, I'm just growing seeds that are more tolerant of my of your of space. My yeah. 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 Of your space. So I, I think at this point, I'd like for you to let's imagine we're standing at your back gate and just walking into the backyard. Uh, I want you to talk about the seed diversity that is happening in your backyard, uh, starting with this little spiny cucumber that's literally right on the left as you walk in. Exactly. So two of my favorite places to get seeds have been the Baker Creek Seed Company at uh -huh. rareseeds.com and the Native Seed Search Company. I also attend your, Greg, your your uh, your seed swap that you, that you host every year. Yep. And now I have the seedbankbox.com where you can actually sign up for a monthly seed box from me that will give you new seeds every month. Nice. So initially I got these spiny cucumbers from the Baker Creek Seed Company and they're called a West I Indian bird gherkin. <laughs> bird gherkin? Yeah, because they're bird, like they have thorns on them, and they're a gherkin, which is uh -huh. like the the English word for cucumber or yeah. pickle or something. That, that was B-U-R-R-E-D. I heard B-I-R-D. It was like, no. all right, how's that Sorry. work? <laughs> it's a hard one to say. So it's, the, yeah, it's it's a bird gherkin. So it's like yeah. a thorny cucumber, and it's yeah. actually oval. It's like an oval shape. Yeah, about the size of a golf ball? I would say so, yeah, yeah. like a ping pong ball. And they're very spiny, but once you eat them, your teeth break the spines off instantly, and they're a delicious, fresh, refreshing cucumber. Mm -hmm. I first grew these in like 2012, and they grew pretty well. They, they climbed like a cucumber usually does, so yep. they had to have a trellis. And they wrapped themselves over my arbor, and so it looked nice and pretty during the summertime. The wintertime weather, it kills it off. It's a, only a summertime crop. Yeah. And what happened was is that for 2013 and 14, I didn't see any – of the gherkins any anymore but this last year for some reason one seed sat there in my mulch or in my soil and didn't do anything for about two years and all of a sudden started to grow this last year uh -huh. on its own wow and all of a sudden i recognized the plant because i had grown it a couple of years earlier and it began to grow and it became so invasive now that <laughs> it took over it took over my arbor it took over my raised bed it took over my tree uh -huh. and i've been eating probably in the thousands of cucumbers. Like me personally, I've eaten over 500 cucumbers this last year at this one vine. Oh my gosh. And it's so satisfying because I didn't do anything. I just kept the water on my irrigation timer turning on twice a day or right. once a day. And the cucumber grew on its own. And now I have got, I've got probably 200 cucumbers that I couldn't even eat that are still hanging off the vine that's now dead that I'm harvesting right now, I'm going to save all the seeds, put them into my seed uh, bankbox.com program. Right. And so this coming like May or so, right. all of my seed uh, bank box uh, subscribers will get the West Indian bird gherkin from my longevity gardens in, in the box. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Nice. So it's just, seeds are kind of like a surprise seeds are like a time capsule yeah. and seeds are also they're like a nuclear bomb you know there's so much energy contained within a seed think about my favorite tree in my yard um, is called a moringa tree uh -huh. and moringa trees are edible the leaves are edible as well as the drumsticks that come off them the bean pods right and it's not necessary to graft a moringa it's not necessary to do a cleft graft or a bud graft or to root a cutting because they grow from seed so quickly you can grow a moringa tree from seed to 12 to 15 foot tall tree in one year whoa and i have got 10 of these moringa trees now in my property we even have the moringa seeds for sale at my jakemace.com right and when you plant one of these seeds in the ground you want to put it in the ground in the early summertime and the tree grows so fast, it's just it blows my mind how much power is in that little tiny seed. Yeah. 
and how it can transform from the size of a dime into the size of a 15 foot tall tree in one year. Yeah. Uh, the, the ones in your front yard, how, how many years old are they? Those ones are now, this is their fourth year anniversary. Yeah. yeah so they are four years old. And I was in your front yard yesterday and I was going to say that tree is thigh size, but it's bigger than thigh size in four years. It's got to be. I, Greg, if, if I give you a compliment, you're looking good these days. You're looking really healthy and fit. So it was almost the size of your waist. You know what I mean? Oh my gosh. <laughs> so <laughs> I, yeah, I was going to say it's uh, thank you for that. And yeah, it was, uh, it was an epic sized tree in four years. And I'm not hitting on you, by the way. I'm totally, uh, I'm totally taken. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> no, I didn't take it that way. You, you could have climbed that tree yesterday, couldn't you? Yeah, I could have climbed that tree yesterday. And that tree was a seed four years ago. The initial moringa trees that I planted, I got two of them from Suzanne Velarde, who's a local grower here in the Phoenix area with uh, Velarde Gardens. Yep. The other two trees I got from a guy named Paul, who I don't even know who he is. He's some gardening guy that I connected with on Facebook. And he met me in the back parking lot of a Barnes and Noble with two six inch tall moringa trees in half cut milk jugs. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like I was doing drug deal in the parking lot. He, he gave me these two little tiny moringa trees in milk carton jugs. Uh -huh. And now I've grown those into 20 foot tall trees and I harvest all the seeds from them and they, they fuel my health and my vegan athleticism because the leaves of the moringa are one of the most nutrient dense foods that human can eat. There's even lots of evidence on the internet that shows that it can be one part of a cancer cure because it's so nutrient dense. Oh, interesting. interesting. Yeah, just look, just do a Google search for moringa health benefits uh -huh. and plant a moringa seed this year. If nothing else from this podcast, plant a moringa seed. Plant a moringa seed. Now, that is a warm weather plant, though, is it not? It is. So I would suggest if you get into the freezing temperatures in the winter time, make sure that you have some ability to keep it warm. Yeah. And I don't know that that's, I, I would guess that it's not going to grow in a place like Minnesota or, or like Chicago. Yeah. Um, yeah but so. I do know people in Chicago, Minnesota, they've had a little bit of success trying to container grow it, even though it doesn't like container growing as much as in ground, but it can yeah. be done. Well, yeah. Very cool. But, and it was a surprise. We did the first uh, seed uh, bank box last month. Uh huh. And we included the Moringa seeds in there. And I just woke up this morning. Somebody put a YouTube video out um, announcing that they received their seed uh, bank box and they were so happy with the Moringa seeds. <laughs> nice. So it's really fun for me to see folks get these cool looking Moringa tree seeds and be so thrilled with them because they are like an alien looking seed. They have yeah. like a little flange on them and they're pretty cool. Yeah. All right, so we just walked by the moringas on the right and the burgerkins on the left, and now we're kind of looking out in the rest of your your yard. Tell tell our listeners what they're looking at at this point. Well, if you looked out in my backyard, you would see a pretty large backyard when compared to my neighbors because they cut my yard bigger than my neighbors for some uh -huh. reason. Yay. Yes, and so you look out now, and it's pretty full of, of trees. There's like about 190 fruit trees in my backyard, which is about a third of an acre. And then my front yard has about another 30 or 40 fruit trees too. Mm -hmm. So at the backyard, we're looking out, and we see fruit trees all around, and there's a, a fish pond, like a five or six foot deep, like a 35 foot by 25 foot koi fish pond with a river that snakes through my yard to oxygenate the water. Nice. And I've planted tropical plants like avocados and papayas and star fruit and guavas around the pond. And then the rest of my yard that's away from the pond has all the peaches and the natives like ironwood and palo verde right. and fruiting mulberry and pomegranate and citrus. Cool. So you mentioned in the, uh, in the intro that you're growing fruit trees from seeds. Tell me about that. Yes. So here's the thing, every, if you're a listener right now, every bit of, pretty much every bit of fruit you have ever eaten, I would say 90% of every fruit you've ever eaten has been from a grafted tree. It's been from a tree that has a rootstock down below and the delicious fruit up top. Mm -hmm. So let's say that you went to a friend's house and they had a delicious uh, grapefruit tree that you loved their, their grapefruits. You could take 
a little cut off a branch of one of their trees if you knew what you were doing, and you could graft it onto your grapefruit tree and grow a branch of their style of grapefruit. Right. And there are certain trees, like a pomelo or certain citrus, that you can actually grow a tree from seed of that citrus. You can wait a bunch of years and be and be patient. Mm -hmm. And when the tree got to a certain size from seed, you can then take that tree and graft it onto something else. So certain trees I have in my yard, like I have some papaya and I have the moringa, I grow those from seed. Uh -huh. So my papaya tree that you saw in my yard yesterday is now 20, it's almost 20 feet tall. And it's jam packed with papayas. Great, and it's only Valentine's Day right now. I know. How, how is it possible that a guy's got a papaya tree that's almost 20 feet tall, jam packed full of papayas in Phoenix in the, in the, in the middle of February? That's and a different conversation. It is, but it's because of the microclimate. But yep. papayas and moringas I grow from seed. The other fruit trees are usually grafted. Yeah. Cool. So it's really important to share seeds. We do the Great American Seed up here in Phoenix, and you're doing your seed bank box. I know there's organizations all over the world out there that are starting you know, seed banks and seed trades and so on and so on. So why don't you tell us a little bit about this seed box that you're doing? It's, you know, I've, I've heard about it for the past three months and rumors and now all of a sudden, boom, it's here. Tell us about it. Well, I was seeing all these people in my social circle really getting excited about subscription boxes they were subscribed to, you know, sometimes for clothes or sometimes for, for anything, for tools or flowers, where once a month they get a box mailed to them they open it up. They don't know what it's going to be, and they're all surprised. And mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was like, "How can that's a really cool thing? How can I surprise a bunch of gardeners? Can we do like a gardening tool or whatever?" Yeah. And I was like, Let, "Let's do it with seeds. So the seeds that I'm going to plant that month. You know, whether it's you know eight to ten varieties of seeds. Let me just take those exact seeds, put them in a box, and share them with my gardening friends. And it became SeedBankBox.com. Nice. So if you go to seedbankbox.com, you can sign up for like 20 bucks, and every month you get a new box full of the seeds that I'm planting that month. Mm -hmm. It's a great experience. The box is decorative, and you open it up, and each seed has a label. Each seed has an envelope, and then you can store them in the decorative box after you're done so they don't, they don't get all messy. And then you can make a tower out of them. So you yeah. can do March, April, May, June. You can have your little tower of seed bank boxes. Yeah. And then the cool thing is that I go on my YouTube channel and every month, the week that we send out the seed bank boxes to the subscribers, I make a custom YouTube video that shows me planting the seeds on camera. So if you get your box, you can follow along with me on YouTube and plant the way I plant. So dude, you're just having entirely too much fun with this whole gardening <laughs> thing. You know, with you know I, I'm not, I'm not really a businessman. I'm just... I just, I'm, I'm into gardening, I'm into fitness, I'm into hiking and martial arts. Yeah. And so I like to share those things and that's why my YouTube channel has 2,000 videos on it because I try to share my experiences with my YouTube audience. Yeah. And so the little things that I do love like seeds and I like to share those with people and that's why you'll see them out there, uh, the same seeds that I'm growing. Now here's the thing, Greg, this is the scary world we live in nowadays. A lot of my friends these days have been Facebooking and they're sharing pictures of the fruit that they're eating that they bought at the grocery stores. And last week I had a friend share a picture of an apple that she was eating from you know, like a local grocery store. Right. And she bit into the apple, put it down, did a project, came back. The apple looked the exact same as when she left like an hour earlier. What's wrong with that? Apples are supposed to turn brown and they're yeah. supposed to get bad. They're supposed to rot. They're supposed to compost. Mm -hmm. So when you take a bite out of an apple and you come back an hour later and it looks pristine or when you drop a bunch of French fries in the in between your car seat and your center console of your car <laughs> uh -huh. and you find them a year later and they look the exact same as when you drop them down there, it's not good. This is not healthy food we should be eating because yeah. – it's human beings trying to meddle with tens of thousands of years of earthly evolution. Yeah. And so I really believe that when we're, when we're doing what's called the GMO seeds, when we're, when, when we're genetically modifying seeds uh -huh. or when we're, when we're genetically modifying mosquitoes or animals, 
we have no idea what the intended consequences of that are going to be. And yeah. there's there's nobody out there smart enough or with enough resource to tell us. So it really scares me when you see these GMO seeds that are already in the grocery stores growing apples that don't rot. Yeah. And I really think that it's more important now than ever to grow from seed, to save your seeds, to share your seeds and keep the heirloom varieties of seeds that have been eaten by humans for tens of thousands of years, keep them alive and saved and don't let the GMOs become the norm. Yeah. So you brought the term up, GMOs. What does that stand for? GMO is uh, genetically uh, modified. And I think it could be genetically modified or genetically modified organism. organism. Yeah. Now, are you familiar with what exactly what happens behind that term or should I share it? I, I am a little bit, and only because I'm tuned into it. But I think you should share it because it's your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're we're just chatting here. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what. One thing before you tell everybody, please. I just heard an NPR news article that was a 10-minute long article all about genetically modified mosquitoes. Oh, really? And go find the article. It scared the living uh, uh, bejesus out of me. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. All right. Very what, scary. So why don't you tell everybody um, GMO seeds? The well, story I want to know what scared you about um, genetically modified mosquitoes. Well, you should listen to the article because they were the experts. But the two things that walked away scaring me about a, a GMO mosquito, which is the same thing when you're talking about a GMO seed, is that when the, when the scientist is genetically modifying mosquitoes, they uh -huh. have to inject, you know, they have to inject these mosquitoes with some kind of a enzyme or a DNA strain to physically change their DNA. Right. And the, they know that the mosquito took the injection because the eyes of the mosquito will glow red oh. if it took the injection. And if they don't, they don't glow, glow red. Well, that's interesting. And then, yeah. And then they release these mosquitoes into the, into the environment so that they are genetically modified to do two things, to breed exponentially and to breed with with the natural mosquitoes that, that mosquitoes that the earth produced so that it destroys uh, uh, malaria in mosquitoes. Yeah. So I, I think what they're trying to do with those is um, they're making the mosquitoes sterile. I think that's part of it is that they yep. make the make the mosquitoes sterile so that they can't actually can't breed. And so. but they said was here's the thing in just like the nuclear energy we have is really powerful for producing energy, but it could also be a bomb. Right. This GMO seeds or GMO mosquitoes in the wrong hands can be the most insane bomb and weapon you've ever yeah. seen. And somebody who wanted to, let's say, GMO a mosquito to when they bite a human to kill a human, they could do that right mm -hmm. now. And you would never know what would happen. All of a sudden, an entire city or culture is dead from, from GMO. Hmm. So well, there you go. I, I, it's a new I, world, and it's very scary. Yeah, that I don't know about. That's that's curious. And that was the whole reason for the article was that there was a yin and a yang of the GMO argument, yeah. and the yang is we're going to provide more food for people. We're going to cure uh, malaria. Yeah. But the yin is that it could be weaponized, and you don't know what mm. the intended consequences of a GMO animal or food will yeah. will be. So I'm really passionate lately about eating food from your front and your backyard. Eating food that was grown from the heirloom called – we call it an, an open pollinated or an heirloom variety of seed. Uh -huh. And then let your garden replant its own seeds and save those seeds to share with others so that we keep the ancient forms of human food alive and don't let the GMO uh, blow into our gardens. You know. Yeah, exactly. So let me, let me just jump in here real quick. Genetically modified organisms – Basically, the science behind it, and I've studied this, studied it not deeply, but I'm, I have a science background, so I've studied it a bit. And what they're doing is they're taking a gene from an organism like a fish and they're putting it into a tomato. That was actually done. And this isn't something that happens in nature. Now, and this might seem odd to you, Jake, but I don't know for sure. I haven't determined whether genetically modified is really bad. I, I mean, my sense is that it's a not a good thing. My biggest challenge with genetically modified crops and bugs and that kind of stuff is that this work gets done and then it gets put out into the domain, you know, basically nature where we don't have any control over it anymore. Um, and that's, that's one of my biggest challenges with how 
uh, corporations are putting genetically modified things out is they, you know, they create them and then they put them out in nature where we lose track of them. Right. So, and the other thing is, is that if you're a local farmer and you have a, a plot of land that grows corn uh-huh. and, you know, several acres away, you have another plot of land that's owned by, you know, like um, a Monsanto or a Bayer because now, because now, because now Bayer purchased Monsanto. Uh-huh. And they're growing GMOs, but the wind blows the pollination or the seeds over to your property. Uh-huh. And even though you were not growing GMOs, if the if the lawyers and the scientists of the GMO farm come onto your land, test your corn, and find that it's GMO, any uh-huh. part of it, they now can sue you because they can say in court that they're that you are illegally growing the GMO corn, even though you, you didn't grow it. The right. wind blew it over. Yeah, that's called drift. That's genetic drift is what that's called. So how can this be a legal thing? Because that well, is just a GMO company can basically yeah. can basically own all the land because the farmers cannot grow corn anymore. Yeah. And a corn that they've been growing for generations and generations that their great great grandparents have passed down is now gone. Yeah, instantly. So I think right. that the GMO argument is really difficult. And you're talking it to is. a guy Greg, who's been a vegan vegetarian for 16 years. Yeah. And I really believe, and a guy who's not going to have children because I'm really trying to reduce my population footprint. You know. Right. Yeah. So I mean, these are my 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 personal ways that I've tried to help the planet. So when you tell me that we have to grow GMO to provide food for the humans, I got a hard time with that because. There would be 20 times more food on the planet if everybody just ate the plants instead of giving those plants to the cows. Yeah. Because it's more efficient to eat a plant based diet. Hence the reason why I'm called the vegan athlete and also why I'm trying to grow my plant based and fruit food at my house. Yeah. Plus, you're pretty, pretty buff as far as I can tell. From Greg. Eating uh, a, from eating a vegan diet for what, a decade? Uh, It's been 16 years now since I was, yep, I'm 35. I've been 16 years, only plant-based, no meat, dairy for 16 years. Oh, good for you. Cool. And here's what I've discovered about that because I've been eating a plant-based diet now for about six months and it's probably not for everybody. I'm going to go there. It's probably not for everybody. And, you know, it works for some people beautifully, right? Like for me, I've lost 16 pounds in the past six six months from it. And I, I did this experiment because I'm dealing with Lyme disease and, uh, you know, I wanted to see if, if, uh, it would make a difference and it seems to be making a difference. Uh, Heidi, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Heidi, my sweetheart, on the other hand, um, found out that she is not allergic. We did, she did a test and found out she's not allergic to, uh, to dairy products. And so she's back on dairy products and, you know, doing quite well on them. So, um, you know, from a health perspective, you know, a plant-based diet may or may not work for you. It's, you know, it's something that we have to explore on a person-by-person basis. And and I never tell anybody they should go vegan vegetarian, but I'm about six foot one. I weigh about 200 pounds. I stay pretty athletic, and I just do my YouTube show um, for fitness and for gardening, and I talk about gardening and plants, and I figure that if I can get folks growing delicious fruit trees and if I can get folks growing incredibly nutritious plants in their garden – If I can, even if they don't want to go vegan, if they fill themselves up with the plants and the fruits from their garden, they'll be healthier and they'll have less of a hunger for the, for the bacon and the ribs in the pan, you know? Yeah. Well, and uh, (laughs) you know what? That's one of my things that I absolutely love is bacon. Uh, And I haven't had any in six months and I don't know that I will anytime soon, but I can definitely get that, you know, the taste of bacon and that I love it. So. Yes, I yeah. try to do the same. I love it too. I try to do like a tempeh bacon yeah. or a tofu bacon, something yeah. like that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, but this to to bring it back to seeds. Please, whether it's a yes. fruit tree seed, whether it's a um, an heirloom variety of seed, go to some sites like my seed bank box is a good site. But even better than than seedbankbox.com is the Baker Creek Seed Company at rareseeds.com or Native Seed Search, and just start having fun exploring some of the heirloom varieties of seed. And you'll find that when you get an heirloom seed, it always comes with a history of where the seed was created, yep. who grew it, like what century was it developed in. And it's so interesting to me that you can grow a plant that somebody in the 1600s was growing. And it's kind of like you have a little piece of artwork and history in your garden. Yeah. 
I just so you, love it so much, Greg. I love it so much. Oh yeah, no, I hear you. So you've mentioned it several times. Let's let's talk a little bit about what heirloom seeds are for those of our listeners that don't know. So two things. So when I teach a gardening seminar, there's always gardeners out there who ask me, does it matter if we plant organic seeds or not? And I uh-huh. think that when it comes to a seed, in my opinion, the word organic is is irrelevant. Because if you take a non-organic seed and grow it from seed to plant to fruit in organic soil, mm-hmm. it's going to be awesome. If you take an organic seed and grow it in a chemical fertilizer, it's not going to be it's awesome. It's going to be awesome, yeah. And so I think that it's better to do both, better to have an organic seed in organic soil. So don't really concern yourself with the word organic when it comes to seeds. Look for the word, it's called an open pollinated or, or the word, um, it's the heirloom. Heirlooms, yeah. Because heirlooms can be harvested. Like say you grow an heirloom tomato. You can harvest the tomato. You can take the seeds out of the tomato and replant those seeds and they will grow into the exact same tomato again. If you plant a seed that's called a hybrid seed, hybrid seeds are perfectly fine. It's just that a hybrid seed is not true to seeds. So if you get a hybrid pepper, Uh like a sweet pepper, and you grow a hybrid seed, and you replant that seed, it will grow into a different uh, variety of pepper the next season. A different variety, how? It just will, it will like, it will genetically change itself a little bit, maybe a little bit sweeter, a little bit different color, a little bit longer, because the hybrids won't always stay true to seed. Yeah, there you go, perfect. But the heirlooms will. So if if you're interested in growing like a melon, like a Crenshaw melon, Mm -hmm. that's an incredible melon to grow or a moon and stars watermelon this summertime. Get those, get a moon and stars watermelon, get a Crenshaw melon, but kind of keep it in its own area so that when you harvest the melon, you can save the seeds and replant it the next summer and get the exact same melon again. But this time, it'll be more suited to grow a lot better in your yard because it's now the child of the parent. Nice, 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 nice. So what one final piece of advice you have for our listeners around seeds you know i would say when you're planting a seed and you get a seed in the mail or from a garden or from a gardening friend or from a nursery uh never plant the seed too deep that's one Uh, tip i would say right if you have a little tiny tomato seed or you have a moringa seed if you plant the seed a little bit too shallow it will still find a way to grow because the root of the seed will grow into the soil and find a way. Uh-huh. But if you bury the seed really, really deep in your soil, it possibly could suffocate it and rot the seed. So always err on the side of a little bit too shallow. Uh-huh. If the seed is a quarter inch in diameter, put it a quarter inch under the ground. Oh, if, the seed is a, if the seed is an eighth of an inch diameter, put an eighth of an inch under the ground. Always put it the same diameter under the soil. Mm-hmm. And uh, the other powerful thing about seeds is two things before we go here. One, say you don't have a garden and you're at home and you want to grow healthier food. You can go get a bunch of lentils or you can go get a bunch of beans or you Uh can get a bunch of a bunch of wheatgrass seed or barley. And you could soak those seeds in water in a glass jar in your kitchen for 24 hours Uh and you can drain the water out, keep it moist for three days in a row and you'll create sprouts. And if you eat sprouts that are grown in your own kitchen, you've now increased the amount of amino acids in your diet, the amount of protein in your diet, and eating sprouts is one of the most powerful things you can do right now to improve your health and your life. So whether it's a seed in your garden or whether it's a seed turning into a sprout in your kitchen, it doesn't matter. Get involved with seeds, grow seeds, have fun, but never order seeds at two in the morning like I normally do because (laughs) – You'll because you'll end up, up, end up ordering $200 worth of seeds. Or $2,000 worth of seeds. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. So make sure that you're not going to fall prey to the QVC kind of bug. You know, grow, uh, Order seeds when you're in conscious mind. And then contact me at my social media. I'm at Jake Mace Tai Chi on Instagram and, and Snapchat. Uh-huh. I'm, my Facebook group has almost 15,000 members. It's called Urban Gardening in Arizona. Oh, yeah. And there's, there's, a, there's people all over the world in that group. It's probably like 70% Arizona and then 30% all over the world. And yeah. it's an amazing gardening group because oh, the is. members run it. Yeah. And what I want to say is when you get your seed and you grow from seed, I want you to contact me on the social media, send me a message or post in my Facebook gardening group and let me know what you're growing because I want to see. Yeah. 
Yay. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show and sharing your experience with us today once again, especially on this auspicious epic episode number 200. It's been Greg, a- I can't believe you've done this many podcasts and your podcast is taken off. There's people listening from all over the world. All over the world. I know. Oh, here's a, here's a quick one. And if she's, I hope she's listening. About six months ago, uh, somebody contacted me from Australia through my Arizona State University address. And she was looking hmm. for a connection at Arizona State University. And so I con- you know, we talked back and forth via email and I connected her with the people that she needed to be connected with at Arizona State University. A couple days later, I get an email from her and she said, oh my God, you're that Greg Peterson. I'm an attorney. She lives in Australia. She was doing, uh, you know, urban agriculture work. She said, I listened to your podcast on the way to work. Oh, that's so cool. That's like, yeah, baby. So yeah, this is uh, definitely a, definitely a, a worldwide phenomenon, growing our own food and learn, really learning how to grow our own food. It is so important. I, I believe at this point in our, in our culture, the most important thing you can know besides breathing is how to grow your own food. You know, it's not going to come from the big agricultural farms because we're reaching the point when people are starting to realize that growing food out, you know, in an agricultural, like, you know, corporate farm setting is actually hurting the planet. Yeah. And so it's going to be up to the people to grow at home, put solar panels on your roof, drive an electric car, <laughs> adopt more of a plant-based diet, maybe do like, do like meatless Mondays yeah. and grow a garden at home and plant fruit trees, plant a garden and try to grow more than me so that we can trade. There you go. <laughs> There exactly. you go. There you go. There you and go. Uh, check out my vegan athlete YouTube channel to see my my gardening my gardening journal my video journal on YouTube in real time. I post a video every day. Perfect. Where do we find that at? Just go to YouTube and type in uh, Jake Mace Garden or type in vegan athlete. vegan athlete. Perfect. You can find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org backslash seed bank box. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. Greg Peterson here, and I want to thank you for listening to the Urban Farm Podcast. We wouldn't be able to keep doing these great shows without you. So as a token of my appreciation, I'd like to offer you access to a list of our top 10 episodes I personally find most inspiring. If you enjoy the Urban Farm Podcast, but don't have time to listen to everyone, then you will love this list. Although all our guests have great information to offer, if you are short on time, These 10 are must-listens. To get access to the top 10 most inspiring podcast episodes, text FARMER to 44222. That's FARMER to 44222. And enjoy listening. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen three days a week for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.